So I'm Alex Pierce. Uh, I'm an Office 365 MVP. Uh, I was awarded this, time, uh, this year for the first time in 365 and I've been a, a, a SharePoint for some years before that. Um, uh, I run a company out, um, in Birmingham called BSC Networks. We are an Office 365 education supplier only. So we only work with the education sector. Uh, a couple of things for you just to know about education. The E1 license that you might have heard of in Office 365, which you normally pay for about £5 per year or you get as part of your enterprise agreement, is free for every single student, every single school around the world. So when they say, oh, can Office 365 scale? Yes, it can because it's got over 200 million users already. Um, the other things that they've done for the parents and teachers um, who are here, or if you know a teacher, you can also get Office Pro Plus for free. All you have to do is you have to, as a teacher, go to office.com forward slash teacher, and you can actually, um, your kids, your teachers can actually get Office Pro Plus. They can put it on their iPad. They can use it up to five devices. The same way if you had purchased those licenses yourself. So Microsoft are doing a lot in education. They're doing a lot of it is free. So as I said, whole of Office 365 is free with that E1 license as well as the Pro Plus. Um, so if your kids are struggling or you're thinking, actually, I don't want to spend um, and buy Office, I have to use some torrent to get it. Don't worry about that. Get it for free. If you can't, then go back to the school because they'll <laughs> sort it for you. So I, I personally like to put up what my personal interests are when it comes to um, these kind of conferences and speaking. So to me, Office 365 education, how can we use this technology in an education context? rather than finance or, or anything like that. Um, configuration, not customization. As much as you can do out of the box, which means it's easier and cheaper to upgrade. And that's where the kind of thing I like to be able to say, let's configure this, not customize it. Let's not customize the master page. Let's keep it as it is, and we'll configure it so it's got those themes, just as an example. And integration. Um, education is all about having different useful uh, learning tools so they all integrate and single sign on and, and how can they work with Office 365 and that kind of thing. So I kind of wanted to start off by defining what um, permissions were and I, I kind of try to get it down to a single sentence. So allow a user access to data and content within your SharePoint environment. Well it may not just be SharePoint, it could be anywhere within your organisation. So as I said, it's simple, I wanted to keep it on there. So just going back to the bingo rules, uh, hopefully you may well have heard me say some of those uh, words already, but I said you've got to get five in a row. I said you've got three fives, there's no diagonals, it has to be straight down or vertical. And just shout bingo, and I said the first three, we'll, we'll get those prizes. And I've got to say it, not that the word comes up on the slide. So a bit of an agenda, we're going to start off just talking about permission types. We're going to go into SharePoint groups, what does a SharePoint group really mean? There's a couple of gotchas within there. Uh, from a naming point of view, we'll look at users, inheriting, and then kind of talk a bit of the Office 365 and where some permissions and things to be considering about how external access works within both the SharePoint site collections in SharePoint Online as well as OneDrive, because they are actually different. And then kind of go into some organisational cultures and structures and some questions that hopefully you'll find are useful when thinking about permissions and implementing them and towards project plans and, and that kind of thing. So very simple. Um, we start off, we've got, I, I think, kind of class them as four major ones, there's kind of three. But we've got viewer, we've got contributor, we've got administrator. Also known in SharePoint language as your visitor, your member, and your owner. What well, we also get within that site, in that area within SharePoint, we can get those site collection administrators, and they can kind of see everything that's within that area. So viewer, as I said, kind of just view, can see that content, they can open up the file, they can view within it, they can't change anything, they kind of got that read-only access. The member can go off, they can change, they can delete, they can upload content, and there's that administrator who can go off and make all those changes that are there. Going e even deeper into, excuse me, Going even deeper and beyond, kind of from a SharePoint farm, if you're on-prem, there are some other users that are there. We've already mentioned site collection administrators, but what we also have is we have a web application, and we've got two types of permissions that we can have there. There's one that's view, and that's normally used for the search crawler, so you'll have a user that'll go off and do all these services across the different site collections, so we can set them there. There's also a web application for control, 
and uh, farm uh, administrator who can go off and just do whatever they want kind of within it. And that's kind of just some things to think about if you're actually putting proposals together and who has permissions once you don't want your administrators putting in their users which means they get full control and can see everything across the whole farm you may want particular admin roles to be able to do that more than anything else when i was thinking about the different types of permissions these aren't necessarily permissions but they are kind of permission based we've got the approver and we've also got the uh, the, the, the decliner i don't thought of it in that kind of way uh, but we can approve and we can decline so we can say here is a, a bit of content I want it to be published and to my front page as it may well be. I want that change on that page and somebody has to approve it. And there's a workflow that runs through that to, as an email may go to somebody. They've got to click on it. They click on approve or they click on deny and they will be able to then see that content appear if they've clicked on approve. So SharePoint groups, it's, there's always an argument that kind of goes on with SharePoint groups or Active Directory groups. And I'm not kind of going to go into what's the best way with this point of view. I want to kind of give you as, as it is so you can actually see it and then make your own judgments. Um, I've got a little star on that there. So it says there's a set of users or groups defined to a single group. So that's a SharePoint group to help manage content better in SharePoint. So we define a group, people can go into it. Uh, we can put act, uh, ad, uh, Active Directory groups or Azure Active Directory groups into that group. One already, Blink Connect, didn't take long. Would you prefer Nestle Dairy Box or Cadbury's Milk Tray? Yeah, milk tray you're a Milk Tray, you're a Cadbury fan, are you? Thank you. I didn't take, sorry, didn't take long. Um, so we can't have SharePoint groups inside of SharePoint groups. That's what kind of what that little star means. I've made a little note in the slide deck if you want to go back to this uh, at a later date. So as I've said, um, it includes individual users or it can have active directory groups. It sees that as a single identity. So a user is an identity, a group is an identity. The, the argument that some people say, well, I prefer to have SharePoint groups instead of active directory <coughs> groups is because in here, when you add an di active directory group, you can't see who the users are inside of it. Wherefore, if you put all the users inside a SharePoint group, you get a big list of who those users are. So permissions are set on the SharePoint group, not based on its name. Um, this probably sounds a bit confusing, but I wanted to show you what I actually mean with this. And it's around the names of it, more than that. So this is kind of a list, and uh, it's just a site called Sam. Um, I've got all my different groups, as you can see down here. I've got my members, my visitors, owners, members. This is not the permissions that they have. It says in the description here, I've tried to make it bigger, use this group to grant people full control permission to the SharePoint site Sam. It's a group. It's not a permission set. Just because it uses the word owner doesn't mean it has permission. So it's kind of just some of the terminology that SharePoint automatically puts in there makes you think, ah, they've got admin rights to this area. Actually, they don't. It's just a description. It's just a name. It's what you give that permission to the groups. And I'll show you that in a demo in a short while. And just to go into that group, um, when we go through and we click onto that group, and I've got some screenshots in a second, what we set within that group is the name, the about me, who the group owners are, which can be a SharePoint group, and a few bits of information. So this basically means, here's our name, it's called SAM Members. It's not got any permissions, it's just called SAM Members. Uh, this group has a grant permission to be able to have access to this site, <laughs> but it's just assuming that it does. If you've taken it away, that description still says that information. We've got an owners group, so the owners of this group is the SAM owners group. Um, moving on to the second half of the page, we can then start setting some information about membership requesting, who the email goes to, do we allow them, is it automatically joined, and, and that kind of thing. So it can kind of get a bit confusing with that names when you start looking at it, and it kind of that might be some of that actually we want to call a group all users. It doesn't mean then that your all users group can have view permission here, edit permission here, owner permission here, depending on whatever you decide that you want it to be. SharePoint groups and associations. So when a SharePoint site is created, and we'll go, again, we'll go through this in a demo in a, in a while, it associates three groups. It tries to associate a viewers group, a contributors group, and a full admin group. So when they are created, it says, I'm going to call this one visitor, I'm going to call this one owner, I'm going to call this members. So 
as you can see, this kind of where it is. So it's creating this subsite called visitors, and it's making them the visitors. So automatically giving that group another one. Do you want dairy milk or Nestle? Sorry, it's a dairy box or milk tray. Milk tray, I think, for the wine. <laughs> Thank you. Nobody like. I prefer Cadbury's as well rather than Nestle personally. Should have bought more chocolates at this rate. Uh, so, um, as I was saying, um, we've got uh, visitors, we've got the matching of that group to uh, the members. So we're kind of taking a group and we're giving them permission within this area rather than necessarily using the names. And this is kind of when I click on use an existing group, this drop down menu appears. It's not that normally that big, it's just I've done it for the slides. So you can see all those groups. So I can actually make the visitors the owners group here. So again, moving on, uh, understanding what a user has. A user has uh, different permissions, and we can go in and we can see what the different area that they can have. So we can, uh, a user can have permission from either adding them as an individual, adding them to a SharePoint group, and that SharePoint group is added, or adding it via Active Directory. And as I said earlier on, we have that problem where um, we cannot see who those users are within that Active Directory from a SharePoint point of view. Uh, a user can also be in a site collection admin, which means they can see all that content within that area. And there's also, there's a kind of, went on some of those areas below, higher farm permissions, which means they can see everything across the whole farm, which you kind of want to stay away from. Um, we have the ability to check those permissions and what that user has and where that um, inheritance comes from. So we go to check permissions, we can see who that person is. Um, so I've done a search for myself as it is here, and I can see where they actually get access within this subsite. Uh, so for full control, I can see that it actually comes from the site owners group, and they've also got edit from that group that appears there. So again, that group doesn't have to be called owners or members. This is the permissions that are set here, not within the name. So when it comes to the breaking down and inheritance of a site and the permissions that it has, You've got the item, inherits it from the list, inherits it from the site. Brilliant. I'm afraid you're the one with an Nestle. I'm hoping they're not actually going to melt within this, uh, within this room and so warm. I'm afraid there's no more, uh, no more chocolate, so play along as you still wish. But I have actually run out and I can't afford, I haven't got anything else to give away. Uh, so, as I was saying, you can in, um, items, when a document is uploaded, it automatically takes the inheritance of the file from the list. If that's taking it from the site, it will do. And if the site, it will take it from the, if that's not inheriting, or if it is inheriting, it will take it from the site above, and so on and so on. We can then break those down. So we can take a uh, file. We can say, actually, I want to break the inheritance on this. I want to break it on the document library. I want to break it on the site. And that's kind of what we're going to go into now from a demo point of view. So hopefully everything that you've just seen, and I've rushed through, which means I've probably got 15 minutes left for at least questions at the end, um, we'll be able to see. So let me show you. So uh, this is our standard SharePoint site. When a, a first site collection is created, we get default groups of visitor, member, and owner. Um, and that's created based on the name. So we've got one here called Permissions. That's my site collection from when it was created. I'm using SharePoint Online, just so you know. So if I go to my site settings and I can do this either as my owner or site collection administrator, this is my back end and I can change all sorts of stuff with content types and publishing <laughs> and workflows and that kind of thing. But um, site collection administrators, these are people who are going to be able to see all my content. And at the moment, I had to put in at least one, and there's that one person, and that is myself at this moment in time. We go to people and groups, and these are all the groups. If I click on more down here, these are all the groups that currently have access to my site. So we've got that visitors, members, and owners. We've got something to do with Excel services. Some people can see everything if they're um, available as everyone, except external users, and we'll come on to external users later on. And then there's an everyone group there as well, and that kind of means everyone. But it doesn't mean someone can just kind of go to the URL and access the file. If I click on this visitors group, we can see the members, currently nobody. But if I go into my group settings, 
this is where that slide you saw earlier on where it kind of says the name but it's, there's no actual permissions here it's just the group settings we can change the, the, those settings if you want to do membership requests if you want them to, they can automatically join and leave this group, depending on the dynamics that you want within a particular area within your environment. We can also set it so they can request. I'll point that link out to you in a short while. Are you open to questions? Say that again, sorry? Are you open to questions? But yeah, go ahead. But um, the uh, email address which somebody can put into uh, access yes. uh, request, does that have any relevance to the share button? Um, no, it doesn't. We'll come on to the share button. The gentleman's referring to this share button that's up here. There are some of the linking with the groups that come through to it, but not re the actual requesting, but no. So I'm going to jump back to the card, go back to my site settings. And if I go to my site permissions this time, I can see who my different groups that I've got and permissions they've got at the moment. So we've got my visitors, members of libraries, and you can see they've got read access, they've got edits, and they've got full control. And again, there's an Excel group there to be able to do some of the Excel services that are required and a group that's automatically there to be able to do that. What you can see across the top in the ribbon, we can grant further permissions. So what we can do is we can add SharePoint groups or we can add individual AD groups and give them permissions. And we'll do that in a moment just on here. We can also um, break the inheritance, which we'll talk about. We can't do that at this moment in time. Um, we'll go to create a subtitle and do that in a minute. We can see the SharePoint levels, access request settings. So this is where those requests, where somebody's requested to join that group. And we can also get to the, the site collection administrators. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a user for now. So I've got a user called Lily. And I go to show options and I can decide do I want to add them to one of these groups or I can just add them generally with the read permission? So it actually kind of is, it's not the best of design forms. It should kind of say that these are groups and these are permissions. So I'm adding them to these groups because <laughs> potentially if I add them to the visitors groups, they could potentially be owners somewhere else. So we kind of want to kind of make that, those groups there, kind of train our users to understand the difference between the groups here and the permissions that are below. So I'm going to actually add them as a view only. I decide to send them an email or not. And you can now see that, there you go, Lily now has access to this SharePoint site and she's only got view access. We can also then go and create a group as well, but this is only a SharePoint group, so I'll just call this a example group. And what I get towards the bottom of the page is the permissions that I want to set for this group within the SharePoint site. So it's similar to that page that we saw earlier on, where we're actually creating some settings. But we're also actually going to say, well, actually, I'm going to make them contributors within this site. So we'll create that. I've added, it's added myself in there. So I can now see that example group. But if I go back to site settings, let me jump back two pages. Better. Do a refresh. You can now see that example group that's now appeared in there, and it's a SharePoint group, and it has contribution rights. So there's one left to do, which would be a group. I'm trying to remember a group, so I'm going to try all. Let's do all users. We'll give them contribute rights. Probably not the best of practice. But you can see it in there, and it comes up now as a domain group. It doesn't say Active Directory because a group could potentially be pulled up from somewhere else, not just Active Directory. But you can kind of see now we've got SharePoint groups, we've got users, and we've got groups <coughs> that have been pulled through from Active Directory. So what we'll go on to next is we'll create a subsite and we'll do some uh, permissions within that area. So site content. And at the bottom of here, not with an app, you can't create a, an area with an app, we've actually got new subsites. So I'll click on new subsites and we can start filling our form. So subsites, I'm going to give it a description. My URL. And what I have here is the ability to be able to say, well, actually, I want to copy all my permissions from the top. I'm going to use all those. So whenever they're changing the top level, it's going to replicate all the way through. And it's just going to look and pull that through. Or I'm going to have some unique permissions. So I'm going to use unique permissions here. OK, 
could do some stuff around navigation if I want to, things that you probably want to define from a government's plan point of view. And while that creates in SharePoint Online, so it does take a little bit longer. Yeah, I, I, I thought that in my head and didn't say it at the time, but when what Mark's referring to is, if I just open up this site collection while that's creating, it's created now. When I go and set some permissions, come on. If I add grant a user on here, if I just go back and take my Lily as an example, there's an option here for send an email. So if it's an individual and it's a user, they will get an email to say you've now got access and these are permissions that you've got. If I use a group, even if it's a distribution group or anything like that, um, we had all in there, didn't we, earlier on? I hope not. If I select a group, even though I might have send an email invitation, it doesn't send the email to the distribution group. It just sees it as a group. There's no other data around email addresses or anything like that. Is that right? Is that what you're referring to? Cool. SharePoint group? If even it's SharePoint group, it won't send it out. No. They don't have an email address associated to them. That's what it is. It just sees it as a kind of a claims ID. I was working with it last night and they thought they were SMTP server. <laughs> no. You've probably seen it if working with users. But not with the you think. So here it is. I've created my group, my created my site. My apologies, and it's automatically giving me some example names. So the the site name was subsite. It's done that visitors. It's done that members, and it's done that owners. So actually, I'm going to have an existing group in here. So I'm going to have my permission visitors as my existing group. And then I'm going to keep those as they are there. It automatically adds myself as a member and an owner, just kind of as an assumption. The, the members group doesn't have to have anybody in there, but the owners group does. So go, there's now our subsite, nice and simple. So we then talked about inheritance, and we will go to our site permissions. And we can now see that there's a button at this top left hand corner which says delete unique permissions. So actually, because it's inheriting it down, it's just looking at those permissions for access for the files. We don't want to do that. And when we click on it, it's going to ask me a question. And it's a hold on, this site includes things that have been shared with specific people. These people will lose access. Well, yeah, that's fine. That's kind of what my whole point is. And what it does is it takes all those and it copies them for you into this section. Where was I? So yes, so we've broken the inheritance. It's copied all the groups and all the users that were in there. So we can see Lily is, has been pop copied through on here. We've got that example group that are there. The idea being is that actually I'll take out all those people. Let's not start afresh. I'll give you everybody who currently has access because actually all I want to do is I want to take out the example group. Stop inheriting. I wasn't expecting that. That must be a change in 365. Sorry, something's gone strange there. So we've got my groups as I was going through. We're going to go ahead and we're going to take this example group and I can edit the permissions that they've got or I can actually remove them. So I'm actually going to remove the example group so they can't access that subsite anymore. So any users who are in there cannot do that at all. And it's very simple now. We've just, like we were doing before, we can say, grant permissions, we can create groups uh, and that kind of thing. One of the things I mentioned was the ability to be able to check to see what permissions that people have. So if I click on check permissions, it gives us a nice little form. And if I say, okay, what permissions does Lily have? And this kind of comes a really good support tool to see is what permissions do they have within this site? Where are they getting it from? So I say check now. And you can see that Lily has actually got access through giving directly. Because they're in that list, you could see that she appeared in there, but she's also got contribute to the all users members group. So it goes off, it kind of does that query of where am I, what permissions do I have? 
So it's a really good support way of being able to check to see who that was. If I do it for myself, the user I'm currently logged in as, you can see that I have it through that extra one through the full control as well. So that again, sorry. Yes, you can do this in any, so the question was, can you do this in a top level site? Yes, this option to check permissions is, is all the way through. So um, if I go into a document library, go to my library and I go to my, oh, go to my library settings, go to permissions on this document library, we've got that check permissions there as well. So it goes all the way up and all the way down. I don't actually know, no, do you? Know? I think it's on the web. It's on the admin you're on, so you use that admission on the web or take permission for that particular web. But yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah that's what I understand now. If it's inherent from that site, then it will be the same following now. But it won't show you where it's. That's where there are some third party tools that allow that whole management kind of process. It kind of says, do I have permission to this document library? Do I have it to this site or this file? That's there. It's uh, if you go into the site and it says, do I have permission to this site? And it's kind of like, it's a yes. If you wanted to go into the document library or particular document library, you'd have to go into that document library to see if that they do that permissions. Or PowerShell. Or PowerShell or get some third party tools that will do something in that kind of way. So going into Office 365, Office 365 is a bit different when it comes to permissions um, because we have the ability to do external sharing. It's something we can turn on, we can turn off, uh, depending on what you want to be able to do. So by default, when we share a file externally, we only have two types. We only have view and we only have edit permissions. They don't have any way of being owners or administrators. You probably don't want external people to, to be in that kind of way. Um, when we give them access externally, we can give them to a site, we can give it to a document library, we can give it to a folder because it's only classed as an item, and of course we can also do it to the item itself as well. When it comes to OneDrive for Business, <coughs> it adds an extra element. You can take a document and you can get a URL, and it means that that person can click on the URL and they have anonymous access to be able to see that document. So that might worry some people. That's, um, people could store those documents within their personal storage within SharePoint Online and Office 365, and anybody can access that, fold, uh, that file. We've also got a shared with everybody, and that permissions that are set within that shared with everybody folder um, is everyone except external. So anybody can get to that folder within your organization and be able to access that content. As I mentioned, there's that anomalous access to content as well. So let me show you some of this. Let me go to my OneDrive. <coughs> using the waffle as it's known. Not many people know that it's kind of nicknamed the waffle. So when I click on that, this is kind of known as the, if you're going to learn, that's known as the waffle. Strange. So here's my, uh, my OneDrive. I've got quite a few files in here. Um, I can see it kind of gives me a bit of information from a sharing point of view. I've got only with me and I've got this shared and that's that shared with everybody. So if anything I put on there, I've also got this presentation. Uh, that's here, and that's shared with a few people. So if I hover over this, press that, we can see who that content is shared with, and I kind of get a list of all those different people and what permissions that they have within it. So there's a, a group, and there's a, an individual user that has those edits. And I can kind of click on Advance, and it will take me to... Um, the same format that you've kind of seen before. So it's a nice <laughs> user-friendly area, but this is that advanced area that we've kind of been through a few times already today. So what I'll do is I'll just take this file and I will share this. And you can kind of see down this left-hand side, we've got three different areas. So I can invite somebody. This could be an external person. This is enabled by default. Um, I'm going to make it a an email address up for now. 
because then I know it's a complete blank one, so I'm going to send it to them. This is outside your organisation, so it, it gives you that information. I'm going to tell them to require to sign in if I want them to. When they sign in, they can either sign in as an Office 365, as your AD account, or they can log in with a live Microsoft account, depending on whichever they decide to be able to do. And we'll send them an invitation, so I'll give them some instructions. Here is a, a document for you to review. Got the ability to say the permissions that we want. I was talking about either earlier on. If it's either view or edit, we'll click on share. And it probably takes about, I find, about three or four minutes to send that email before they actually get it. But the permissions are actually instant up there. As I mentioned, you could do document library. So I can say share, and I can do that whole document library if I wanted to. It invites somebody to be able to do that. Let me share this one document and I'll go to get a link and we've got two options here which is similar to if you ever use the OneDrive personal, not OneDrive for business, OneDrive. We can create a link so this view only document now has that link and anybody can click on that who I decide to email it to and we can also create a link where it can be edited as well. And again, just to go through that last one, we've got that shared with who is it who can currently see this file or folder. Just jumping back to um, the site that we created earlier on, the sub-site, um, the gentleman had pointed out earlier on, we've got this share in the, uh, the top right-hand corner. This is kind of where the association of the visitors, the members and the owners kind of comes in quite key, because this is kind of where some of that back-end code actually goes into. So if I click on share, what we're doing is we're inviting them to the site, <coughs> allowing them access to this area. So I'll say I'll do allow to this time at pfcnetworks.com. And an email will be sent off to them. And, what it is. and again, I could decide what group do I want to add them to. And this is kind of one of the things that worries me around this element is that I'm determining which group that they're going into. Well, that potentially means they can see lots of subsites of content as well. They potentially, could also see content all over the place depending on what that group is. Does that make sense? So just some of the thinking, actually, is external sharing a good thing unless you've trained your, trained your users so they go into the right group? So it's telling me that this example group in here has got contribute access, so I can add them to that group if I want them to, and then they get contribute uh, to it. However, I may not actually want to give them into that group because of where else that group is actually being used. Just a question around that list yep. which is being shown there. Are you seeing this because you are the site owner? Yes, I'm a site owner and I can do permissions, which is why I can do that. If you were, if you were an ordinary user, you would still have that share. Yes. Would you see that list? If you are a contributor to, to come contributor to the file, you can do some of those permissions to it. The site is slightly different to what you actually get. But it, as I was kind of saying is that, yes, that, that list is kind of, it is. It's just automatically generated. It just appears in that kind of way. So what's your method of um, managing? Uh, I, I personally think it can only come down to training. So the question was kind of what do you think the method is behind the training on that? Uh, uh, the, the managing of those permissions, to me, it's down to training of the users so they understand the difference. You're thinking, all I want to do is get them contributing on files. I don't want them worrying about permissions and, and that kind of thing. And that's kind of some of the questions I'll ask in a, uh, in a while. But I think it's down to training or to kind of having more of an env open environment, which is kind of what Yammer does. So I know it doesn't answer your question, but also, uh, it all depends. So I'll send that out. There you go, I've actually got external sharing turned off for this area at this moment in time. <coughs> Let me just jump back to, so I've got my, um, Jump to the right slide. So 
So I just wanted to talk a bit about organisation cultures and structures towards permissions. And um, this kind of question helps drive where I'm going uh, in the next slide. But what should be accessible to all users to view, edit or comment? What is it, that, that de big defining question, what is it that we allow people to access within my organisation? As we know, Microsoft a few years ago purchased Yammer. The idea of Yammer is that people can use hashtags, you can follow hashtags, and you can view and you can comment based on the content that has been added. So this open organisation, so people can see this bit of content even though it's not related to their job and make a comment about it. Well, that's what Yammer's doing and it's kind of a bit open Facebook, Twitter-esque kind of thing. Do we want to do that within the organisation? I've just highlighted a few words. Do you want all your team to stay on top of it all? Well, if they can't stay on top of it all, if they can't see it all. But also, as I said, I've just highlighted files there. So do we access them and what do we give them to files? So have we got projects going on? Yeah, OK, there's always going to be ones that need to be kept more secure. But is it, if they're not related to their job, can we actually still give them access? And if it's something that maybe they're interested in or if they decided to work more hours in the day, in the evening, and they're just browsing through, would it be nice of them to add their comments through Yammer? And that's kind of the Yammer approach. So what should be accessible to all users to view, edit, or contribute? Do we make it so they're only in that silo, that they can only see what they need to be able to see, or should we kind of broaden it out a little bit more so they can see and comment, view? That's kind of something to be thinking about. Does giving user access to content that is not direct to their job prevent them from doing their job? What I was trying to get on to this, I don't think it quite makes sense, but is that that element of if we give them access to something over here, let's just say that person's in charge of SharePoint permissions. But if we give them access to the files that is to do with active directory groups, will it actually enhance their roles? Well, they're not part of that part of the business, not part of that group, but they might find that information useful to enhance their own role and to support the organisation. And I guess the next bit goes on to this last section here is that should they be able to comment and contribute towards those files or just have view access to it? Does an open approach to content and comments help improve the contribution to the content in that data? I guess that's an open-ended question. It all depends whether you want people to, to be able to make those comments. But most people who have actually had Yammer for some time have seen that actually they find that people are contributing better, this kind of water cooler effect that goes on the, by the, the tea and coffee machine and that kind of thing in a contribution area actually helps towards um, people in other parts of the world to be able to see that content and contribute and build that content and better projects and better teams and also better themselves as well. Should an open approach to social networking mean a different approach to how we do permissions in other areas, not just SharePoint? So if you're thinking about Yammer and the approach to openness and networks and how you can see different content and people can just go off and see that, do we need to review how they see other content? Does it actually help them to enhance their role? So kind of taking all that into, into view, um, the kind of some of the closing thoughts that I've put together, um, and one of the things I was thinking about, I was actually on holiday last week and my wife was very bored while I wrote this presentation on permissions. She doesn't really care about SharePoint, not alone SharePoint permissions. But one of the things that came to mind is something we talked about is that content is delivered and owned by the organisation. It's not owned by me. I don't take it with me. and It's my content. It's my IP. It's the organisation's IP. It's kind of relevant to their role. So should SharePoint permissions be based on the role of the person, not the individual themselves? So I'm Mr. Organize, um, um, I'm the operations director. I see lots of uh, data. I see lots of files that go on. I see how this bit of the organization is being run. I'm seeing how this works. I keep my eye on these projects and that kind of thing. If that person leaves, a new person comes in, they only get access to a few of the files that they're defined by groups, not necessarily as the individual. So actually, where's the business continuity that comes in if that person leaves? So should we actually be looking at, actually, this person moves on, how do I know that they're still keeping the same eye on that project and that kind of thing? So it's a kind of a different approach to permissions. Do we not get rid of that account to give them some Do we rename that account 
So it's not called Joe Bloggs anymore. It's called Lily Eaton. And it's kind of just take it on there because then they've got permissions to everything else. So how does that work from sites and files to external access? And then how about their OneDrive? Because that's effectively where all the work that they were doing was being stored within their OneDrive. It's their personal storage. So if they were working on that as a project they've been working on for two, three years, it's hidden away in a personal file share should they be able to access it as they're actually moving on. And that's a, a very different kind of approach to permissions, but maybe something worth thinking about and moving forward with. So, some final thoughts. Um, there is no right or wrong way of doing permissions. It's all down to how it works for your organisation, more than anything else. If you're finding that things are too restricted, your staff are saying things are too restricted, I want to be able to access this, then maybe it's time for more of a review of how you do it from an organisation. Maybe as you've got that Yammer experience coming in, do we want that open approach towards permissions as well? Um, I think it is key when you're thinking about those things that anybody who you're talking to needs to understand sh uh, SharePoint permissions. They need to understand that there's members, there's contributors, what that means, and hopefully some of the session today has helped to be able to take that back to your organisations. And then consider what the right approach is for you. Uh, think about your role. What was it that you would like to be able to see? Would it help you to be actually go forward and be able to see more openness within files and projects? Can you become an advocate in that kind of way? And once you've kind of got it implemented and move forward and you're finding that everyone's kind of using it and you've got a very open approach, it can be very difficult to then actually close it back down and restrict areas. And you're spending a lot of time just kind of closing uh, permissions and preventing them from doing it. So it really does take a bit of time. Yes, you've got your hierarchy, and you build your SharePoint site structures and you know that this is going here and all that kind of thing. But think about who's going to have view, who's going to have member, who's going to have owner within those areas. So, probably a little bit short from a session point of view, I do apologise.